All right, guys, so this is Jackpot, and Jackpot's doing awesome riding. A little sensitive, still a little kicky if you try to fiddle far with his back legs, uh, but between his back legs and his buddy sourness is kind of what we're looking to work on today. I want you to think about this. If your dog has good obedience, then you can take a dog to a dog park and they're not running off with other dogs. They're not getting in fights with other dogs. Not because the urge isn't there. That's a big misconception. We're going to change their urges. We're going to change what's on them. No, no, no. You're just getting good obedience, good respect. The same way if, if you want to stay at your friend's house and play, but your mom said, we're leaving. Well, then you're leaving. You know? You're not old enough. You don't get a vote. So the thinking is from the time we put the halter on to the time we take the halter off, we're dictating what's going on. We dictate where they walk. We dictate where, where they tie. We dictate how we're doing everything. If you want to feed your horse carrots out of your mouth, I'm, I'm good with that. If you want to lay him on his back and scrub his belly or teach him a smile or come give me a treat, I'm good with that. But it needs to be on your terms so he gets in the habit of always giving you his undivided attention. And when you're not giving him instruction, that he's sitting there waiting for you to give him instruction. So we're simply going to walk off. So when you see him really trying to evade you going backwards, that's an awesome time to start trying to soften them up because they're not very strong going backwards. So he tried to run to the left, that didn't work. Tried to run off to the right, that didn't work. Two eyes and two ears did work. Two eyes and two ears did get him relaxed. Good boy. Good boy. So from here, I'm gonna lower his halter just a little bit. Now the blowing and snorting and stuff like that, notice how we don't pay it much mind. A, a horse snorting never hurt nobody. A horse looking and blowing or shaking or doing, never hurt anybody. It's their reaction to that fear that hurts you. So that's what we're trying to work on and focus on. I have some people that they really believe that they want the horse to be perfect before they move forward. They have to be completely okay. Well, if you wait for the, for the right moment, the right moment's never gonna come. You just gotta take action and go. What we're looking for is things that don't pose a threat to us. So we don't want him running off and we don't want him running into us. So we're sending him off and already I noticed the steering wheel is kind of sticky. So even when he's moving, all that was a big circle of side pass because he couldn't give me his face and move his feet. So right here, he should step around with his shoulders and then he should walk a circle around me looking at me at the same time. He is not doing that right now. So there's no walking or looking. No problem. Do you have a set of reins? No worries, I got reins. Do you see when you break it down like this, just step by step, it becomes so apparent, hey, there's an issue here. That's what we're looking for, is that clarity. Put a double ended snap under the halter, that keeps it from riding up his face. You don't want to give, now you got to wear pink. That's what you get, fella. Oh, are you kicky? <laughs> so we're touching his back legs, which he doesn't like. Now we're going to circle him the other way. Notice I'll get right over their shoulder. One of the things I love about this is you're getting in their bubble. They're smelling you. You're above their eye. So much groundwork that I see folks do has nothing to do with riding. What the heck does you being 20 feet away from that horse got to do with you straddling it? You go from being in the same vicinity of a horse to being as personable as you can get. Once you're straddling something, y'all are pretty personal at that point. I don't want the first time that I get in their bubble that I am straddling him. I want to be over his eye. I want to be in his bubble. I want to be behind his eye. When I get in that first gray circle, the, the one that these last two have denied me, 
I'm in their bubble, I'm back by the saddle and I'm behind their eye. So they're seeing me back here behind their eye and I'm driving them forward. That is so much more closely related to you being on their back and driving them forward than you being this far away and lunging him with a whip. Hell, any horse can run away from you if you whip at them. Doesn't show me how broke they are. You being in their bubble and behind their eye and you can just reach out and, and touch their belly whenever you want to or pop that saddle when you want to and they just accept it and allow you to be there. They're soft and they're going forward. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing. It takes a pretty broke horse to do that. So same thing with this worldly bird. Sam, I have a horse that doesn't want to allow me to do that. Well, I got to find a place where I can be safe and still ask him for what I want. What do I want? I want him to be soft and easy in the face. But also, I want to be able to be in his bubble before I get on his back. Well, here, that's pretty easy. I'm up over his eye. I'm not worried about a strike or a bite because I have the lead rope. I'm outside of the shoulder, so he's not likely to strike me or run into me. He's not going to spin around and kick me because I have the reins in the other hand. I have something touching his butt. He's giving his face, moving his feet. Are you starting to hear like a pattern happen? Give me your face, move your feet. Give me your face, move your feet. Come again? So right there, you just see me bumping him with my knee, right where my foot was bumping. And again, I could do that because I got him all kind of bent up. Why am I okay being in the kick zone? Because I have his, bent, his head bent into me. It's very hard for a horse to bend their face towards you and kick at you at the same time. Notice another thing, I love when they drop their head like that. When his pole drops below his withers, it releases an endorphin that kills the adrenaline. So it's essentially shutting the adrenaline pump off. One of the things I liked about the, the Morab is by the end on, the, on that loose rein, he was looking to put his head down. He's not bred, made, or anything to have his head down. He's like a giraffe. Okay? He wants to have his head in the air. But when that adrenaline pump shuts off and you get them soft left and right, they start dropping their head. So even when I'm starting starting Arabian stud colts, I still want to get them so soft left and right that I can put their head in the dirt because that's going to get them relaxed. The more relaxed they are, the more pliable they're going to be. Him being all uptight and I just can't send him in a circle around me doesn't make him very pliable. So the, the more relaxed I can make him, the more I can get him to drop his head, take, take deep breaths, allow me to be right here, the more pliable he's going to be well, the more pliable he is, the more money you're gonna get in the same session. What I mean by that is the more advancement you're gonna see. A lot of times at the clinic, the auditors and the, and the parents of the other horses will, they'll be judging which horse is the smartest. Hot dang it. The smartest and the softest is the same horse every time. Because the horse that's the softest, that's the least resistant, is also gonna be the horse that gets in your way the least. So they're gonna do the most for you. You're gonna be able to advance the most with them. The horse that everything you say, they say, but um, no, I don't think so. That keeps interrupting the class, okay? So when I was a student, believe it or not, the teachers didn't like me that much. And I never understood because I considered myself a charming young man. Uh, it's because I was a class clown. So I kept taking attention away from the class. Yeah, 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 yeah. Believe it or not. I know it's hard to believe. You envision me studying in the library, huh? But the reason that's a problem, the reason that's a problem is it takes attention away. So every time that we just say, hey, turn left or turn right, and instead the horse throws his head up in the air, or jumps this way or that way, it's taken away from the class at hand. It's taken away from what we're trying to, to get him to do. So reverse that and have a horse that just goes anywhere. You pick up the reins and then, yes, 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 what can I do for you? That horse, you're just gonna be able to layer as much stuff on. We'll show them how to side pass. We'll show them how to do the come give me trick. We'll show them how, how to spin. We'll show them how to stop. And then all that will be one session. 
because you're doing it just so they don't suck at doing it and then you're saying okay good job i don't want to wear the tryout of you let's try the next thing and that thinking and that ideology you're really going to be able to layer on the behavior that you want so a lot of times i tell my students i have an academy where people come learn how to become horse trainers i tell them i'm too lazy to argue with the horse every day for 30 days you send your horse for training and he might be a monster the devil ate a child child last week i want to have a come to jesus on monday Tuesday okay by Tuesday I'm sorry I really didn't mean it I didn't know who you were when I started talking to you by Wednesday they come out waving a white flag yes I'll do anything then the rest of your month is easy even if that horse was a handful he's not a handful now and you're treating him like the horse you want him to be in the rest of the month you're just layering behavior you're just saying hey I need this shoulder to move here hey I need you to side pass hey I need you to move your butt whatever it is becomes easy at that point the only thing that changed is his respect level and his attention level good job Come over here. Oh, we need to grab your legs. Don't worry, you're gonna like this. Don't make that face. You can't run away. Nobody's ever outside past me. Face first. Now grab it. <laughs> now let's grab those back legs. Woohoo! Woohoo! There we go. There we go. Grab his face first. Flank second. Grab his back legs. Now, I think I remember last time. Last time we touched some back legs, and I, I think I remember a yellow flash that just passed right. You know what I remember? I remember the rocks hitting the, the fence and it's going ding, 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 ding. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, you're doing a good job in that case. Really good job. I love to see, I love to see horses two years in a row, three years in a row, and every time you're working on them, you're working on something different. That lets you know somebody's doing their homework. If somebody tells you they're, they're working their horse, but you, you have the same conversation you had last year, Never call anybody a fibber, but the work works if you work it, what you'll find out. So I think, I think it must be what like doctors feel whenever you tell them you're, you're not drinking and they're looking at you and you're, you're, your liver is swanning and they're like, hmm, sure you're not. Uh, it's the same thing when people say, oh, no, no, we've been doing a respect series. Hmm. Hmm. Good job, buddy. Not too shabby. Well, thank you. Yeah. Look, the second that that the horse kind of like lays on me or has an issue with it, I'm looking to make that adjustment. The whole idea of horsemanship is the least amount of effort on your end, the most amount of response on their end. So that's the whole point that you know the most advanced horses in the world are dressage horses and reining horses and they're using finished bridles that have shanks and curb chains because they're trying to, to get that so subtle that they barely move anything and they're getting the response that they want they barely move their legs that horse is getting there they barely move their hands so it's the same way on the other end when we're trying to basic just with a halter i still don't want to have to put a lot of pressure on you to get you to turn your head Release. 
Bump, 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 bump. Good boy. And there I'm just trying to out persist him. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Goose ya. Nunk, nunk. So y'all have the the most awesome way to break in a horse. You got the shortest riding season, the wildest critters, the, the <laughs> toughest terrain. Uh, and it's like, well, hey, <laughs> we can see the ground. We got to ride. <laughs> Winter is coming. <laughs> Winter is coming. You got to go and you got to go now. So a program like this that's kind of speeds up the process, it could be kind of beneficial for you guys because you guys don't have that all day, every day. I've been at, at clinics where I listen to a clinician, and they say, if you just do this for the next six weeks, by then you'll see results. <laughs> yeah. <I must. laughs> Y'all be four foot of snow in six weeks. You got, you got to get there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hey, I knew you guys were built different the last time that I was here. I was standing right under that barn, and it, it's like 50. It's overcast. It's raining, and all the girls are, are standing out in the rain. And I'm like, and I'm like ladies, y'all want to come in on the roof? No, we're enjoying the summer sun. And I'm thinking, hot oh, damn it, these women are built different. <laughs> They're built real different. <laughs> For us, that's like the frigid part of January when it gets into 50 degrees. Yeah. Speaking of which, when y'all get tired of the cold, y'all should come visit us. I'm telling you. Hey, so we have a cool, we have a cool um, cowboy quarter western hotel, like whole little western town, and people come in and flying from all over the world. From we get Europeans, Australians, uh, Mexicans, Canadians. People come from all over, and they spend a week with us. All you can eat, all you can drink. For some of you northerns, just the all you can drink will make us break even. Uh, they, they get cold up here. Hey, I've noticed that the more north you go, like I thought a southerners drank, but the more north you go, like we were hanging out in, in Wisconsin and, and Montana, the more north you go, the more people want to drink. It's like that's how they keep themselves warm. So I can only imagine Alaska. Anywho, every morning we have one clinic topic. So we'll have like the first morning will be like the tedious stuff like this, like, hey, you have to be able to turn your horse. Hey, you have to be able to back your horse. The rest of the week, in the morning, we'll go, say, play a soccer tournament. With big soccer ball, all the horses in there. In the afternoon, we'll go on a trail ride. In the morning, we'll go to our world-class obstacle course. In the evening, we'll go chase steers around. We'll sort, uh, we'll sort and rope. Um, in the morning, we'll do liberty and trick training. Uh, in the evening, you'll get to ride all the, all the Pasofino stallions, all the gated stallions with my father. So every day is something. If you guys don't plan on trailering your horse down from here, you. <laughs> yeah, if you guys uh, don't want to trailer your horse down from here, you get to ride one of our horses and you can pick from quarter horses, uh, trick riding horses, or you can ride gated horses. Or you could just ride a little bit of everything. What kind of horse is jackpot? Oh, gotcha.
So this exercise here is the very beginning of me adding a second hand. Everybody rides with two hands. When they get in trouble, they grab all the reins up, two reins come right up towards their neck, and the horse gets bunched up because all the buttons are being pushed. So you notice the opposite of that is riding just with one rein or the other, but at some point, we just want to be able to grab two reins and shut the horse down. So this is where I like to show them what two reins is about because here, if he gets fussy, I'll just let this go. Like if he wants to rear, I'll just let this go, we turn the circle. If he wants to buck or run off or, or do, do what the Morab did and kind of go through that, I'll just let go of the outside rein. I already have you off center. This will directly correlate to your buddy sourness. If he's more worried about these reins getting picked up than looking for his buddy, well, he's not gonna look for his buddy. You just say, hey, excuse me, buddy. Pick up both reins, he puts his head down, you let him go. Very quickly, he doesn't wanna look for his friend. But you gotta layer that behavior. What I mean by that is, first we gotta show him how to come off the reins before we can start, before we can start telling him to put his head straight down. I love when I give them their face and they want to put their head downward versus upward. That was kind of like an epiphany moment when I figured that out. And then once I figured it out, I started to go hang out with people who like to drop horses' heads, cutters and Western pleasure riders. And all of them told me basically the same thing. How do you put your horse's head down? Well, just ride it until, until it relaxes and then his head will, will go down. Well, the horses I was raised on were so hot and explosive that if you waited for them to relax, you're going to be waiting a long time. So instead, I started learning how to ask them to drop their head. Western Pleasure Mentor showed me how to pick up my heels and put spurs on them, picking their belly up to get them to drop their head. But before you can do that, you have to be able to just ask them with the reins. And this is by far the easiest method that I've seen to break a horse's resistance down. Again, because the ball is so much in your court that they can't really fuss back. What are you going to do, get a long shank bit or, or draw reins or a martingale and hold them down? If your horse doesn't give, doesn't give the pressure well, doesn't have a good relationship with pressure, and you put those aids on them, they're going to pop because they don't know how to, how to find their way out of, out of the, the pressure that you're putting on them. The most amazing mentors I ever had, they have one thing in common, is that they could take your horse off for a walk, walk him around for 10 minutes and give you a different horse back. My father's real good at that. He'll grab your horse and he won't do shit but walk. And you think, man, when are you gonna ride him? When are you gonna work him? He'll give you the horse, it'll be a different horse. But it's this right here. It's that touch, it's that feel. It's that them understanding. If they can't understand this at a, at a walk, why are they gonna understand it at a canter? You know, you see those horses that are loping around with their head in the dirt, you better believe they can walk around with their head in the dirt. They don't just magically hop on like Black Beauty, catch them in the wild and swing a leg over and six feet, two hearts, one drink. That's not how it works. <laughs> it's not how it works. It works by simple pressure releases. There we go. <laughs> Pressure, both reins, both reins, both reins. Waiting for him to give and release. What's the difference of pulling two reins back to you when you want to slow down, when you want to stop, when you want to back, when you want to put their head down? How diggity does? It's four different things that you're saying the exact same way. How do they know the difference? Exactly, when you let go. Uh, so it's very important when you're trying to differentiate these things, especially when the horse doesn't know what you're asking for, lock your mind into the task at hand and don't let go until they do that task. So if I, 
if I ask him to drop his head here and he starts backing, I'm not going to let go. We might go all the way to the other end of the arena before he drops his head an inch. It doesn't have to be any, barely drops his head enough for it to be noticeable to him and I, he and I. Then I'm going to completely drop the reins. Well, the next time, he's not going to back all the way before he tries to throw his head down. So right here, I pick up the reins. Release. So he took about five steps, six steps. Let's see if we can get it faster. Are you understanding, guys? So a lot of times our brain checks out when things don't go right. You want them to drop their head like the professor told you. You picked up the reins. He starts backing. You throw the reins back at him. Well, essentially, you just taught him how to back up better, which there's nothing wrong with that. But as we're trying to get these different things, these different tools in our tool bag, it's important that we focus on the task at hand. And by that single-minded, one-track-minded focus, you're really going to be able to make it far. Through focus and repetition, you can get a freaking horse to do whatever you want. The problem is, when we use the word focus, it, it means that the horse can't take us away from the thing that we're trying to accomplish every time they, they get fussy or they throw their head or they go the wrong direction. Because if you follow them down that rabbit hole every time, it's very hard to stay on track. All right, now we're gonna go around here and I'm gonna start putting my heels on him and dropping his head. Put my heels on him, drop his head. So all that looks like is before I grab his face, I pick my heels up, put my hands on him, he drops his head, I release both. Heels. Why isn't he going faster forward? If you look at my legs, I'm taking my knees and my calves off of him. I'm not squeezing him forward like I'm squeezing out toothpaste out of a, a tube. I'm trying to pick up his belly. There we go. So he's kind of strong and he's just like one big muscle. And he likes to carry himself very square, straight, and kind of high headed. So the opposite of that is hanging his, his head and neck from his withers. That's where he's going to be the most relaxed. So if we can show him how to move here and be comfortable there, well then you're going to be able to turn off his excitement whenever you want. So if you just ran up that hill, you'll be able to get to the top of the hill, put his head down, he relaxes. If he sees something in the woods, you'll be able to redirect his attention back to you. And ideally, he'll get so good at this that you could just point your toes downward momentarily, put your heels on him, and he puts his head down, you don't even have to grab his face. When I'm using the halter, the snaffle, you see I'm being really ridiculously obvious where I want him. So my hands aren't right here in the perfect box. My hands are as low as I can get them because the halter is direct contact. So if I pick my hands up, well, he's going to pick his head up. So I want to start dropping my hands to get him to drop his head. I'm sitting back over his butt. Oh. A lot of times too, when I'm looking to drop their head, pick up their center, pick up their belly, lower my hands. But another thing is sit over their butt. I had this epiphany a year ago, year or two ago. Pick a sport in horses, any sport in horses. However the person sits, that's how the horse looks. If you see a jockey, they're all stretched out and over the horse's neck. How does a, a Kentucky Derby horse look? I mean, good for racing, ugly for anything else. See a jumper, how do they sit? How does a jumping horse? Okay. The opposite end of the spectrum, how does a, a cutter look? You see a cutting trainer in, and he's sitting back here just like this. And how's that little squatty cutter look? Sitting over his haunches, all sprawled out legs out just like the cutter's legs are. The reiner is a little bit more forward than a cutter. They sit up a little bit more right. The reiner still suck back over their butt, but a little bit further up than the cutter. So what I'm saying is, however 
you ride is going to have a direct correlation to how your horse looks. If you're sitting over there with us pushing the middle down, just like, oh, you might, you guys might not have this, it's pretty. In the south, we have these things called, called pools, and there's pool noodles. And you sit on the pool noodle because the water is not ice, it's, it's swimmable. No? Not funny? Okay. Never mind. You sit on a pool noodle, and the front and the back of the pool noodle go up, right? Well, it's the same thing. That's why so many English horses and, and horses who people are sitting upright, they sit over the withers. You push the withers down, it's going to pick their head and their butt up. So if I really want to fast track or make it clear and easy for him to drop his head and use his butt, if I sit over his haunches ridiculously, I'll sit back here, well, that's going to pick his withers up. As his center rises, the front and the back are going to fall. So his butt's going to come further under him. His head's going to drop further down. So I'll, you start putting a few of those things together, low hands, you're using your heels and you're sitting over the butt and any horse is going to change the way that they're going as opposed to if we sit up here and grab him on a short rein well heck he's gonna he's gonna do this the same reason whenever you're looking for a slide you're trying to get a slide out of a horse you can't throw yourself back right when you stop because if you do that you're going to flatten out their back and they're going to start stopping on their front end and now you're scotching you want to already be sitting back here over their butt having their back rounded now there's somewhere for their butt to go whenever they stop so all these little, all these little tricks really help for what you're looking for. So he's sensitive and soft. So when I ask him to go forward, I want to put my hands where I want them first. So head down first. Then from here, I ask him to go. Nice. Oh, very nice, buddy. I lost my, my microphone to one side, then I lost it to the other side. <clears throat> Is your light blue? Oh, yeah. Notice as I have a horse that's more sensitive in the face that you've been putting your, your homework in on, now it's just a matter of saying, hey, this is our standard, it's what we're looking for. Less flexing and less hassling than we did with the last horse, but that's because the horse is already given. So I don't like to put a number on anything, do this for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Do it to your horse doesn't suck at doing it and then move on. Notice I said when they don't suck at it, not when they perfect it. Because as we move on and we do more advanced stuff, coming back to the easier test is gonna be easy for the horse. <clears throat> So in this case, now we're saying, hey, can you move around behind this frame at any speed forward? Can you use a little bit of left, right at speed? But he's doing a great job leaving his head down. But this is the thing. We're being very honest with him and putting our hands down first and then asking him to move off second. What a lot of folks will do, they'll get a more advanced horse like this that's ready to advance, and they give the horse the face to go, and then they say, but that's not where I want your face. Well, that's a little, a little dishonest there. Here's freedom, but give it back to me. No, no, no. This horse can already give and go. You already got him soft enough where he can give his face and move his feet. So what I want to do is I want to start saying, now that we're there, I'm going to flex you less. I'm going to hassle you less. I'm going to bother you less. But 
the margin of error is going to get smaller and smaller. The more advanced you are, when you're a toddler, you can do pretty much whatever you want to. You can't get in trouble, you know, when, when you're little. As you get older, you get in bigger and bigger trouble until you're an adult. I mean, everything, anything you do as an adult is wrong, okay? And when you're doing good and you do everything and you're a model citizen, do you know what rewards you get for that? Well, they don't lock you up. Great. What do you freaking do? So, what we're saying is the older and more educated you get, the smaller the margins of error are. What's well, the same way with this guy? He's the most advanced horse that we've ridden so far. So I'm starting to say, hey, put your head. And when I say he's the most advanced horse that we ride, he's willing to let me ask him at that next level. So now I'm starting to say, hey, I, I want your head here. I want your head here. Now, since you can walk there, I want you to trot there. Notice when I went to canter him off, he ran into my bridle first. He gets on the wrong lead or crossfires, I just send him off again. But one thing that doesn't change is my hands. He ran so fast, he ran out. What? That right, happens. If you're going to be Alaskan, you got to be tough, right? So, as we start getting more advanced, you start seeing us doing less. So, that's very similar to what a uh, a reigning practice would look like. The difference is we would have a bridle so we didn't have to do so much with our hands. Our hand would be in one place. Our bridle with the shanks would tell him to do the exact same thing. But as he's lead flopping and switching and bopping it, we wouldn't be adjusting too much. We would drive him more into that. We would get where, where we're putting our legs on him and say, hey, we're gonna continue to go right. We're gonna continue to drive. It would behoove you to stay on your, your right lead instead of so much how many times have you seen somebody cantering around the horse gets on the wrong lead and immediately the person just starts jabbing and poking and prodding and trying to fix don't try to fix just stay at the task at hand drive a little faster make him use himself a little bit more he's make him make it his idea to do the right thing i see so many people get so wound up about you know what lead the horse is on if you'll just stay at work if you'll just keep driving that once i caught another gear he had to switch because he couldn't, he couldn't give me another gear and be cross-firing or be on the wrong lead. Uh, so really, I just left my hands at home. The, the other thing that, that was a big difference is I left my hands low and started asking for those departures where he starts learning how to, from a standstill, from a walk, can and never bump into that barrier. That's how they're getting that show quality look where the horse can completely go all the way through the gears, walk, trot, canter, uh, stop, slide, roll back, canter off again, and the horse never gets out of frame. They never throw their head one time. First, they do what you saw with the past couple horses where it's, they get them soft and easy and respectful. Then, immediately, my hands start getting quiet. So look at, look at the difference in me riding this horse versus the last horse. The last horse, I was busy, busy. Right, 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 left, 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 left. Right, 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 left, 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 until he understands. This horse understands, now I start leaving my hands at home, and now the communication starts happening more with my body, more with my legs and it starts looking more and more like that show ring what we're looking for so this horse canning around uh, with his head down being able to canter off stop go through the gears that's a show horse a show horse is a horse that you can do everything the most amount of response on his part the least amount of effort on your part quite frankly this horse is at my house we, we already start making those bridle adjustments 
So for this guy, you already trans I like to transition from a halter into a snaffle, from a snaffle into say a snaffle with shanks, and then a finished bridle would be some kind of correction port or a bar bit, something solid. What you'll find is early on, through the halter, to the snaffle, snaffle with shanks, all those things are bendable and floppy. The more bendy your equipment is, the more margin of error there is, right? So, so he can really mess up. Here, he can mess up pretty good before he gets grabbed. While we're cantering around there, I mean, he can really get his face turned around there pretty good looking outward before he runs into my halter saying, hey, don't do that, okay? Once you get to, you're on a solid bar bit, there is zero movement. Wherever you put your hand, that's where you want your horse. Now, in my opinion, we build them up to that. You know, we show them, hey, look, this is gonna happen to you if you bend or you do this or do that. As he gets softer and easy and our hands get quieter and quieter, then we get whatever bridle we need. If it's a dressage horse, something to pick their head up and bring their nose in. If it's a rainy horse, something to put their head down and be on loose rein. The next thing I wanna work on this horse is his backing. When I go to back him, I'm gonna sit on my pockets and I'm gonna start waving my feet right here and asking him to back up. Oh. So he's backing pretty decent. Notice I said ho. What's the relevance of that? The relevance is this. If you don't tell your horse to ho and you're pulling back on them, they're only gonna back as much as you pull. So they're never gonna fly backwards. Spinning and backing, I want them to think it's part of the transmission. I ask you to back, I expect you to back until I ask for something different. Ho. Ho. Good boy. Ho. Once you get that, these guys where they're backing up pretty good like him, the very next thing that we're gonna start doing is steering while we back. We steer backwards the same way we steer forward. Take a leg and a rein off, put it back on. Take a leg and a rein off. When you got them pointing where you want, put it back on. Leg and rein off. So we're steering using his shoulders. Eyes here, open up. What happened, buddy? I thought you wanted to back. Turn towards the corner, shut down. Put my reins and my legs on. Oh, and if he wants to keep backing, we'll keep back and keep steering. You think you have good steering going forward? You get that horse steering good going backwards and apply that to forward, that's so much easier. Steering becomes an absolute breeze. You wanna make a good bridleless horse, you wanna make a good neck reining horse, back them a minimum of two or 300 feet a day every single time you ride. So my Western horses, my roping horses, uh, my demo horses, every single day that a saddle touches their back, they're gonna get back to a minimum of two or three uh, stretches up this arena. By doing that, everything forward seems so much easier. It's kind of like putting things in perspective. The difference in steering the front end versus the back end. What do they back with? They push back on with their rear end. That's their motor, right? Same thing they push forward with. Well, I see folks who want to steer going backwards by using their motor to steer. The problem with that is every time you ask them to turn, you're taking away their motor, right? So if we show them how to steer with their front end as they're going backwards, we can ask them to steer and go backwards at the same time. And they can, get, they can cross over in the front as their back end is pushing them backwards, which is quite beneficial. See how he is with, with soccer ball. I'll push it out here for you guys. Anytime something exciting is going to happen, you sit back on your butt and you keep facing up.
very quickly, if he goes left, he gets pressure. He goes right, he gets pressure. If he pushes the ball, he gets left alone. You'll get a horse that doesn't want to play soccer to seem like a good soccer horse. The same way a lot of my roping buddies think that you need a cowie horse to be a good rope horse. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, a lot of cowie horses, they want the cow so bad that you really have to convince it like a blue healer. Yes, chase it. No, don't murder it. Yes, chase it. Murder, no. Okay? Well, cowie horses are a lot of times the same way. They want them to put you out of position because they want to be right up on it and biting it. What's well, the same way? If I have a horse that's kind of nonchalant, maybe a little scared of a cow, I play soccer just like I play that. I keep putting him in my position anywhere else than exactly where I want to be. I'm a healer, so I want his right nostril to be on their, on their left hip, and I want them to be right there every time. I want to, to be able to release him in this open field, him go find a steer and put his, his nose on their butt. Well, with that being said, anywhere else they go, they get hassled. When they go right back there, my hand goes right to their withers and my legs stop bothering them. Very quickly, you'll get a horse that isn't, isn't a fan of a cow and they'll seem like the most cowy horse. That's simply pressure and release. And what I'm trying to explain is you can get them doing anything you want if you're that persistent and more importantly, that clear, to have that kind of clarity. Any other questions, young lady? Good job. Very cool. Are you back in tomorrow? Yep. Maybe bring the bridle that, that you're working and we'll... The raw okay, perfect. Yeah, bring that one and we'll, we'll see where he's at in that. So a lot of folks will, I really tried to fall in love with a, a old Western Basel, mm -hmm. you know, like the old cowboy Basel. The, the, the only reason that I haven't fallen for that is because that works really good if, like, for a guy like this that kind of goes in, it's fine. But for the green horses that I'm bringing up, since the reins are on the bottom, it does this to the halter. It's as if you're steering. The, the halter does a great job exhibiting what that does. Whenever you pull here, watch the knots. I pull this to my left. Look how it takes the knots to the right. So that's the reason that I just couldn't, I couldn't come to working that full time. It would have been a lot more classic if I could do all the work that I did and I did it with a rawhide. The problem is I'm always gonna take the most evolved thing that, that's available to me. Um, and the difference of, like, again, not your horse, but the horses that were before, that we can reach up here and grab these knots up top and point the knots in the direction that we wanna go. Boy, what a difference it makes for a lot of those horses. That, that little bit of clarity of being able to grab up here versus down here. Good job. I'll part my clips. <laughs>